with that, I'm going to pretty quickly stop talking and hand over to Leslie, who is the VP of Research Integrity at Digital Science, and just frankly does really amazing and cool work around all of the things she's about to talk to you about. So rather than me introduce all that, I'll hand over to someone who knows much more than I do. Uh, it's all yours, Leslie. Well, thank you, Johnny, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So I promised you to talk, promised to speak about research integrity, trust markers, and introduce forensic scientometrics. So I never said it would be in that order. Uh, so we shall start. So I am Leslie McIntosh. I, as you, Johnny already mentioned, I am the VP of Research Integrity at Digital Science. I come from a biomedical background. My PhD is in epidemiology, and then I uh, was uh, an academic professor at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, before starting my own company, Ripeta, and then now I'm at Digital Science. So that's my um, quick foray into that, and I can go into how I started looking at uh, trust in science and how did how did I get to that journey, but not in this talk unless there's questions afterwards. Want to just thank from the outset my collaborator, collaborators whose work is also in here, Simon Porter, who's also at Digital Science, and Cynthia Hudson Vitali, who is now at Johns Hopkins as an associate dean in the libraries there. She and I worked together at Washington University, and she introduced me to a lot of um, library information that I didn't know. So um, I do work for digital science. A lot of people don't know about the company, but they know about the product. So I just kind of put this in here to give you um, a, a feel of that. And because, you know, I moved from academia into the corporate world, but digital science is an interesting place to work. So I was kind of happy with it. So let me dive into to what we're talking about. You know, we spend, and I say we spend, in the scholarly um, community and looking at scholarship. So I'm trying to be very broad. And if I say science, I don't mean just STEM fields. I mean science more in stemming from philosophy, philosophical, and then growing into what it is now. Um, but the ecosystem that we're in now, we spend a a lot of effort on verification, especially when it comes to publications and when it comes to the work that I do, um, which is, do we trust what we're seeing in research, in scholarship? Um, and I would suggest that we invest in streamlining trust. We streamline verification and we streamline monitoring of research. And I'll show you what I mean in a little bit. And I'm going to start with um, fake art, because there's a lot of similarities to fraudulent artwork, to what we are seeing and what's going on in science right now in the scientific ecosystem. This is a painting that was attributed to Goya, um, but is by Lucas um, Velasquez. And you can actually Wikipedia has a pretty nice thing about different um, fraudulent art and fake artists. So what is what in the world does that have to do with what we're doing? So in art, if you're trying to decide whether something is authentic or not, we look at the prominence of the work. So who you know, you, you actually have to have a, you know, somewhere that says this was the previous owner, who was the previous owner, who got it from someplace. Um, if you follow any of art fraud, you will know that now the provenance documents are also being forged. So it is always an arms race in this. And there's a similarity to what I would say we're seeing in the scientific ecosystem right now. The second checks though, right? Because if you don't have the provenance, Unless it's something absolutely, you know, spectacular and you're going to get it and you're a very good charlatan, you know, it's not going to pass uh, for much. Um, but if it does, the provenance, you know, passes. You go on to is the construction of this work consistent with the materials and the methodology available at the time. So they can look at things like it for a while it was, well, 
uh, is that the right type of frame that would have been on a piece of artwork if we're looking at paintings? Um, and then they got into, well, could that color have been available at that time? Or was that color of art used by that artist? Um, and now you've probably heard enough of me about art and go, what in the world does this have to do with research? Well, in research, we also ask things like, what is the provenance of this work? Who wrote it? Who reviewed it? Can they be trusted? Who funded it? Who approved it? Can it be replicated? Those we are calling the primary checks. And really, they are fabricated at this point, but it is difficult to truly fabricate, and I'll walk you through why that is. The secondary checks um, are looking at the verification. Is the construction of this work genuine? This is the image manipulation, the data manipul manipulation, data fabrication, author manipulation. Is the form of this work consistent with the discipline? Hopefully you can see now the, the questions that we ask of art, we are also asking when we are looking at trusting research, trusting science. And the, the tertiary check is really monitoring. Um, does the provenance over time create a believable narrative? There's citation rings, there's unbelievable co-authorship co networks, and there's a possibility to actually look at this ongoing rather than wait for bad things to happen. And this ties in a lot to um, where preprints fit in. So just so we have one slide of all of those, we have trust, verify, and monitor. So when we talk about trust at the, there's a concept that um, Actually, I, um, with my team at Repeta, developed and then simultaneously in a slightly different um, definition was going on over at ORCID with trust markers. And we're coming together in one of the working groups with United to Act, just to let you know, on um, and, and going to put out something official on trust markers. But these are the, for now, they're the individual elements important to understand, classify, and categorize trust in science. So. The first thing on the left, you want to do, you want to look at the authorship. Um, do they have a research history? Do they have a manuscripts graph? Um, are they graph, excuse me, are they with an organization? Doesn't have to be with an organization, but these are checks that we can use. And then if you look at um, a paper, which is our unit of measure in, in research, um, do they have the elements that we call transparency for right now, do they have the elements that support the research life cycle and ecosystem? So the author contribution statement, the ethics statement, the funding statement, this doesn't necessarily um, talk about the research itself, that gets into reproducibility down there, but this is very important when it comes to trusting or not trusting the research. Now, all of this um, has to be taken into consideration in that, you know, should there have been an ethics approval statement? In some research, there doesn't need to be, so somebody shouldn't be penalized for not having something that they shouldn't have. On the other hand, um, there are places that these things are missing um, that would be obvious. So I'm from epidemiology. If we had an ethics statement missing on a paper, it was, we well, it wouldn't pass anything um, for most legitimate journals. But in computer science, it's actually very common not to have ethics approval or ethics statement, even when they're using human data or animal data. So this is a place that we need to look at um, and have conversations. We are having conversations with institutions on how to improve this. Reproducibility is there. I'm not going to go into it as much because we've heard so much about data availability statements and code availability lately, um, but happy to talk more about that later. So uh, all of this, so that's a quick introduction about research integrity, if you will, as, it, as it's called now, and a quick introduction of some trust markers. There's actually quite a, quite a few more trust markers than there, but you don't want to be here for three hours, so I'm not going to go into any more. Um, what happens when we start checking science, though, right? How do we trust it if we aren't checking things? And what's happening now is individuals 
are doing a lot of the checks. A lot of them are called sleuths. Some people are not are, are doing work that I would not consider a sleuth, but it's, it's still very important work. It's very disconnected. Some institutions do it. Some publishers do it better than others. Some government and funders investigate scientific, um, scientific misconduct and to some degree scientific trust and trust in science. But um, what my colleague Cynthia and I are have put forth is an emerging discipline to protect the scholarly record called forensic science metrics. And I'm very fortunate to work at a company that's a company that's funding this right now to gather people together to talk about how do we start overview, you know, looking at science, communicate, how do we communicate with um, trust or mistrust in science? And at different levels, the micro level, like the, the sleuths just got together in Porto about, you know, image manipulation and some other types of manipulation. Um, but there's also um, networks that go, go on that transcend any one paper. Also, things are going into policy. Um, there's also social media and just media in general. So there's a lot of different layers, the micro, the meso, and the macro level that we need to look at and felt like it was time for a discipline. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on one aspect that I know quite a bit about. Um, it is not the only thing that we're doing in forensic science metrics, but I'm going to talk about author manipulation because this affects all of us right now. And I think it's a place also where preprints and uh, people working in preprints can really make a difference. So let's look at author authorship manipulation um, from two perspectives. One is just at an individual level. So the way that you check an individual is you can thing, do things like cross-check author identifiers, and you can look at their network of collabor uh, collaboration network. Um, and I think this is, uh, uh, well, I'm gonna give you two examples of a fake authorship and authorship for sale. I think I had a slide in an extra one. Sorry about that. So let's look at fabricated author Dragan Rodriguez. Now, Dragan Rodriguez, for those of you who already know, is a completely fictitious individual. It's also an, indiv uh, an interesting name because if I pronounce it right, Dragan is from um, more of a Yugoslavian name and Rodriguez is more of a Latin name. Now, people, you know, could have made children from those two different places and named that. Interestingly enough, I can't find a person with this name anywhere um, on a Google search. The thing that you will notice about this person is if you look at their profile, they have no publications. They go up in publications, which would be normal if you're starting out. Um, they have quite a high citation mean for a, a very short period of time. And then the reason they drop off is because they actually got caught. So that part you wouldn't have seen while something is going on. But the other thing to note is if, excuse me, if you look at the right, is their, um, the collaborative collaboration network is from three different countries. And at a very young age, this might be a little abnormal, not necessarily, but just things that you have to look at. One of the things that came up is there were no author identifiers like ORCID for this person at all, which again, sometimes that happens. We can't ever say with 100% certainty that this isn't the case, um, that this isn't a, a person until we we dig and it actually you know someone admits it or we find out but in fact when you look at their network um dragon rodriguez is connected to the same four people who are then connected to other people so this is an unusual network and we do use dimensions to do this to look at what does um, the typical network look like of an individual and you actually have to look at this by field of research and by um, by the age of which the researcher is. We call it researcher age. So how long have they been in the field? 
And in fact, this is a little bit unusual. Um, and, and in fact, this person ended up um, fake. There is no person, there has never been a person at Case Western Reserve uh, University in Cleveland in the United States by this name. But Case Western basically said, yeah, no, this person hasn't been there, but this person is still in the scholarly record. So now the question is, well, what do we do with that? And we're still answering that just to let you know by um, here at Digital Science, but that's also a question in Forensic Science and Metrics. What do we do with things like this? Because you don't quite want to take it out of the literature for certain things like investigative um, things like we do, but you don't want to leave it in when you are doing um, a scholarly research. So one of the things, though, that that develops is that people leave a fingerprint. They leave a scientometric, forensic scientometric fingerprint. And let me take you through what that looks like in an authorship for sale. And we do have a paper on archive. It is under review. This is with Simon Porter and it's long and detailed and some people say they don't get through it, but Simon gives an excellent talk on it as well. So good bedtime reading. So this all started, I'm going to start from the very beginning of this. This started back when Twitter was still Twitter, and it um, and I forgot to don't write to info at rapeda.com. Sorry, I should have taken that off. But this came out as a tweet. Somebody was very upset because their paper had been plagiarized. This was a published paper. Both of these were published papers. So I was sitting there and I thought, oh, this would be interesting to see if I could go and look and see how many of those truck markers actually could I find in this paper and would it help me identify anything? So if we're looking at the trust markers, these are the ones that are gonna become important. Um, in this case, the funder is going to become important or the funding statement and also the authorship. So let me tell you why. So I pulled up, I figured out who had um, who had plagiarized this person, even though the person on Twitter was an anonymous account, you can dig and figure out a few things. This is not the paper they were talking about, just to let you know. And here are two of the things that were that stood out. First, if you look over on the right, you're looking at the authors and you look at the emails and see that um, Hotmail is interesting. Some people still use it. A lot of people don't. It's interesting to have um, two Hotmails that are one's a dash and one's an underscore. Um, and that person doesn't have any university affiliated um, email. Again, there are plenty of people that use their Gmail or in China use 123.com. And it's just what they use and they use it commonly. So again, um, you can't just take always take one thing and one thing only. The other thing, though, that stuck out for me was that, um, and the paper that I looked at, it said in the funding statement, this one has it in the acknowledgement, that it was supported by the Pharmacon Neuroscience Research Network. And when I put that or in dimensions, it didn't come up. Sorry, it's now, it was grid, it's now in ROAR but a, an identifier for an organization, it didn't come up with anything. So I was fortunate enough to work at Digital Science and said, hey, you know, who's in charge of this and why isn't this an organization? And they said, yeah, well, we aren't sure it's an organization. So I said, okay, I'm gonna dig a little bit. So I just did a, a free search of Pharmacon Neuroscience and this is what I came out with. So. If this were a funder, it got a lot of publications very quickly. Now, one of the other things going through my mind was, well, maybe this um, wasn't actually a funder, but a funded type of consortium that just started publishing and they're working on, on certain things. So I tried to keep an open mind on that. But then I also um, started looking at the network patterns of the individuals. So this is not one of the individuals in the network. I will get to that in two more slides, but this is researcher one who has 30 years of experience, four years of publication. This is where they published. 
pretty pretty typical network for somebody like this. I mean, that with that many uh, many years experience. Here's researcher two with 20 years experience, four years of publications where they published, and here is the person that was uh, suspected of of maybe being part of the authorship for sale, which turned out to be true. Um, this is a lot of publications within two years. Something was up and we could tell by the network. So what happened? Um, this in 2022 became the top retraction watch, um, how a tweet sparked uh, an investigation that led to the PhD student leaving. I can go into the details of that at some point. The other thing though, was that we found out that they weren't all um, seeming to be people of a network that were just trying to publish a lot. This is the case where all of the other authors were at the same institution. They were younger in their career, non-native English speakers. We think what they did was they traded authorship for translation services and the institution started working with them to so those younger researchers wouldn't lose um, their positions. And I don't give any more details than that because we don't want them to have to lose their career for making one bad mistake. At the same time, it has to, uh, the scholarly record should be corrected. Um, how it's going part three is there's only one retraction. Um, Udine admitted that he plagiarized over 70% of his papers and only one has been retracted, even though this has been out in the public for two years and he was not the only person in that network. Um, but we continued to work and started looking and Simon Porter came in and was like, well, let's see if we can automate this. And what are the patterns that we see when, when we look at all of it? And we can tell you that they're a young publication age. So we're really looking at people who are early in their career, an egocentric network with a low clustering co coefficient, um, which we go into in the paper limited or no senior authors, loosely connected to high volume authors. There seems to be a low level of mentorship and a greater number of authors than norm for the field of research. And that's very important that we normalize this um, for the field of research. So one of the things we're looking at is finding the network shapes that match the suspicious author model. So when you see network shapes of, of co-authorship, there's actually pretty common patterns that we see, but what happens here is they become very unique. And that actually is the fingerprint that gives them away, is they're too unique, if you will, for their um, position, uh, their, their stage of research, and um, whether they're a student or probably a postdoc. Um, and I, I mean, if you just look at the green, right there on the graph, the histogram. Those are uh, represent the subset of researchers that have produced greater than 20 publications in a year at a very early stage, right? So taking the same pattern and looking at someone who has 30 years of experience, it, it, it's gonna be different. Someone could publish 20 publications in a year. And if you're in physics, that may be very common. It's not common in everything. So how does this happen? This happens through authorship for sale, citation cartel, peer review manipulation, bribing editors, ideological alignment among authors, not disclosing conflicts of interest, many, many more. And preprints are being, are being used in this cycle. So what do we do with this polluted information river? And this is AI generated, if you can't tell by now, because I think we all know the patterns of AI generated images at this point. Um, what do we do with this, this polluted river? The fabrication of research like content undermining our shared ability to recognize fact from fiction. That is a threat to research and that is polluting our river of knowledge. Now, how in the world, because I haven't said one thing about AI, if you were marking off your bingo card, I just said it. What's the difference? AI threats to research is it's an effortless fabrication of research like content, undermining our shared ability to recognize fact from fiction. We can, with those primary checks, looking at trust markers, looking at the collaboration uh, fingerprint that they leave, which is actually really hard to fake. Um, it, it may not be in the future, but it is right now, but we can look for that regardless if it's AI generated or not. So I would say it's 
pretty depressing, but it's not as depressing as it seems. Because to me, what is depressing is when we sit by a polluted river and we're thirsty and we don't do anything to clean it up. We don't do anything. We act powerless. Um, and what's happening in forensic science and metrics and in other, I mean, other people are doing this is there's individual initiatives to clean up the scientific record. I would say that is not sustainable. It's noble. It's getting us to where we want to be, but it's not sustainable. What we really need is coordinated cleanup and monitoring of the scientific literature using things like trust markers, like looking at authorship for sale networks, which is what we're doing. And that's what I'm advocating for. Happy to talk through anything else, but I think that was about what other people spoke. So Johnny, I'm gonna stop there and happy to go into Q&A details, whatnot. That was remarkably on time, thank you. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so we'll open up to questions. Use the raise hand function if you have a question. Um, I mean, I've got questions to start with, but one thing I'll hi I'm just going to come back to you to highlight because it's been a bit of a discussion in the chat is that point about um, personal email address use. Yeah, this is this is something I saw not recently, but certainly a couple of years ago. There was a few discussions on Twitter where people were flagging papers and discrediting papers based solely on someone not having an institutional email address and I completely missing yeah. that there's lots of reasons people don't have one there's the global south as i mentioned is big for not using them or not even having them to begin with yeah and and it, that's why i hope i made the point clear that it is it is not a sole check by and never should be by any stretch of the imagination it's just like okay we can't verify that they're at this institution so let's go on and and look at some other checks for that exact reason and and people i think there's something in the common people move institutions um, some people even have you know less their their name you know phd or whatever it is so they know that it's that gmail or that you know yeah but again it's a check and it is something that we look for um Lonnie? Yeah, I wanted to also add this. There was, um, there was, I think, not so long ago, preprint, I think last year, that some of us commented on on Papier, I think, where uh, the authors actually checked for what they called like potential red flags of researchers, and the email address was one of them, uh, including also like international collaboration. So two of the things that you mentioned, right? Uh, like re really weird international collaboration patterns. Uh, and it was like, the way the preprint was written was pretty much onto the like, well, when whenever we detect this, we know it's a potential red flag and therefore they should be like right away, like uh, notified somewhere. And I remember there was strong criticism of that and actually going more into like what, what you just said, right? Like when we see that, then we look a little bit more. There's a human in a loop. It's not just an algorithm that would just put a tick mark on like, oh, suspicious, done. It's like, well, no, uh, it may be suspicious, but then an individual looking at it will be like, well, actually, these people are all like researchers that have worked together in the past. They were maybe at the same institution for a while and they all moved or whatever. Like there's lots of reason for why this could happen. And I really like that you put the emphasis on this in your talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I'm trying to to find the preprint again. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for yeah, my that, comments. That would, that would be lovely. And thank you for that comment. I just saw um, one of the people I follow on X and she had posted something and two people just said, oh, how do I get into this? I really enjoy this. And I, this is another reason for forensic science metrics, right? Is because how do you define someone who is in this field? Because there are a lot of people who want to just call out people. And, and let's be real, that is going to harm a, a lot of people who are already at a more disadvantaged um, place. They're going to either be newer researchers, they're going to be maybe in the global south who are at a country that don't get quite as much credit, but they could be doing great research. And so we need to be careful instead of, you know, uh, hey, let's call people out on social media and say that they're um, doing something bad. We don't do that. Um, it does have to have, excuse me, I mean, no, to, to reiterate what you're saying, a human in the loop. Yeah, I just found the preprint again or the puppy of Fred on it. So I linked it in the chat if people want to take a look. Um, I think Kave also participated in some of these discussions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, 
And I also think just for people to know, if they haven't seen this, like you mentioned individual people working on this, uh, yeah. but you're also part, uh, I think, of the Invisible College or Collège Invisible, as Guillaume would say, it, and we are a little bit more organized, but it's still individual efforts. Yeah. So we're working on getting the funding and we just had uh, a group at the first meeting in FOSI at the WCRI World Conference on Research Integrity in Athens, but working on doing a couple more, including bringing that to Costa Rica with RDA, so um, pulling in Latin America as well. I think Binet was next, if I'm, yeah, yeah. and then, yeah. Thank you, Leslie. I think, you know, in addition to these uh, fictitious authors, as you know, there are a lot of people who are not fictitious, but their work is more than fictitious. You know, I'll tell you <laughs> oh, yes. Because, because if it is a fictitious author, we identify and, okay, we say, okay, this paper is bad. But then to deal with the problem where the person is real, but the work is fictitious. And uh, many a times, and I'll tell you, this particular week, we have a big news in India. There was one gentleman... Oh. He has more than 90 popular mentions, out of which 35 papers were retracted, 35, 35. And this is in a single journal where he used to be the editor-in-chief. It's a bioresource technology by Elsevier. I'm sorry if people from Elsevier is, and are there in, in, in this meeting, but it just, just says that many a times the bad that happens to the publications is not necessarily from fictitious authors, but these people, and being an EIC of the journal, he inserted his name almost to all papers. So to me, this is even worse than being a fictitious paper, because if his author doesn't exist, you can't, you probably have to go back to the real guys who exist or the journal or the editor. But in these cases where the person who is in a position of responsibility, being an editor-in-chief, being with a senior scientific position, you know, does this and not one, not two, not 10, not 20, 35 of those retracted and maybe more coming, who knows? And uh, and basically nothing happens to him. And I can tell you in India, there is absolutely no price to pay. They will probably form a sham committee and the committee will say, okay, stop doing it. But he had his time. He had a great time in his lab. He's retire is retiring soon. So the question is that I think the issue of finding somebody who is doing fraud is one thing, but what does the system do to show to the next generation of scientists that how do we deal with people like that? Because I think we have to set examples of if somebody is doing it deliberately, and of course we all do mistakes, a retraction is not a problem because you know I, I, I'll send a link to everybody. I did a podcast with uh, Ivan Oransky recently. Uh, mm -hmm. Retraction, I see being a practicing scientist, retraction is a good thing. We do mis mistakes. When we find mistakes, retracting an article is a good thing. The problem is if somebody has 35 articles in his own journal retracted, where he has inserted his name, it's certainly not an honest mistake. So I think the, the community as a whole has to find some way that how do we set an example to the next generation of scientists that is not okay to fraud and there is a price to pay? Yeah, thank you um, for saying that. Yeah, I just saw that about the Indian author, but the truth is in the network that I showed you in the Pharmacon network, um, Elsevier was uh, in there, Springer Nature is in there, MDPI is in there, and I can go to and have turned in to the non-Elsevier um, publisher that I think this is your rogue editor on this journal that is part of this network. Two years later, still publishing, still going on. So, you know, one of the things that I really want to do with FOSI is bring this together and what are the ethics, what are the, you know, what are the pressures that we do and what are the, what are the solutions that we have besides going to social media to say this? Yeah, you know, I mean, at this point, two years later, I'm about to do an update on this and just go, where are we two years later on this, but we are working, I will, I will be very, um, 
uh, open about this, that there are certain funders that are very interested in working with us. There is a publisher, and I will do a shout out to Sage because they've been great to work with and also working with trying to correct the record. Not that they haven't had issues or anything, but they're working very hard to correct it. So I think we're gaining a bit of momentum on that, but um, there's organization with this. The other thing that I want to just quickly add, and I was looking for a link, I may have to send it, is if you look at the international, you know, the Indian Research Watch, which is Achal, what's his last name? I'm blanking on it right now. But um, okay. one of the things that would be that will be coming out right now or, or that we worked on was a taxonomy for retractions reasons. So instead of they're all bad, you know, that some are just flawed research so that we can start differentiating it. And he has just put out or their group has just put out a dashboard so that you can look at it by country and you can look at it by these category categorizations. So I think we're starting to make some some nice strides that way. And I'll see if I can find the link and answer questions. Um, and if not, we'll figure out how to get it to the group. So yeah, Kaveh, I think you're next, yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you, great talking and great conversation. Um, so many things to say, but I'll just briefly, on that last point you made, Leslie, um, uh, if you're not aware, there is a NOISO standard just released for yep. attractions, et cetera. Uh, and there's a scholarly kitchen post that came, I'll put the link here, uh, a couple of, couple of days ago, you, you'll find it. So that's so that we, we so that when something is retracted or withdrawn or whatever we call it, it we have a good uh, sort of metadata for it. Um, did, just going on a, a few points that come to mind, you mentioned provenance right at the beginning of your talk. I feel that is a big, big, the most important thing. Uh, we have the technology, the top technology is available to have provenance throughout, uh, let's say images that I've done a lot of work with images. Um, at the moment, what we get is a JPEG image that's sent through, you know, Photoshop, whatever. What you really want is provenance from the image. Say you took a picture with a microscope. That needs to have some kind of hashed, uh, you know, metadata inside it. And every time it goes through, say, Photoshop, whatever, uh, it, it actually uh, hashes in, in a com completely... Um, a sort of fail-safe way so you know exactly what happens you have full provenance that that's the way to go and there is a i'm happy to talk later about there's a, a standard there that i'm looking at um uh, oh, and then we mentioned how uh the the collaboration from different places there's so many things that you, you know people mention like Bina mentioned you know uh the, the editor etc um the uh, what I see often is a paper with, you can see that there's an author from Malaysia, one from Egypt, one from South America, et cetera. And they're working in the lab. Well, where is this lab? Where, where is this, this mouse or rat? Okay. Now I know we, we don't want to uh, be prejudiced against any country, but what I thought is we have something like um, the, the uh, NOISO credit system where we say who did what. Maybe we can have a system where there's a tiny, like a paragraph description of how we came together, how I came to work with this group. I don't know, just an idea. So, you know, it's got nothing. I put it in. So it, um, uh, and uh, and then I I do agree with with BNA that there's no often there's little consequence. Uh, you know, the the I think institutions should take more responsibility and say sorry if you retracted five papers. What the hell is going on? So thank you, I'll be quiet now. Thank you. You know, just, just one comment on that, and thank you for that, is, or two comments. One is, I have yet to find a country that doesn't participate in some sort of scam of science. You know, yes, you will see from certain countries that it's more likely to be um, these authorship for sales, and some it will be more stacking authorship with your friends that really didn't do the work, and some, you know, that we've seen plenty in the United States. I'm based in London now, just to let everyone know, but I'm from the States. We've seen plenty uh, Stanford University professor, you know, manipulating things. So I don't think anyone is immune to that. To the second point, and, and this gets back to the first one of needing a 
human in the loop is you cannot make assumptions just by the location. And I'll give you the example that I, I people at work tend to send me stuff and say, does this look suspicious to you? You know, and I saw one and the, the people hadn't, uh, or, or two people were from different countries, but it was Italy and Greece. And anyone who knows that area, Southern Italy and Greece actually have similar, have, have some strong ties. And I just had this hunch that they were probably connected, you know, two of the people and sure enough they were. And I said, here's what I think happened. So I don't, you can't go on just the country alone. You can know people, even if you're a young you know, person, that type of thing. So that was an, a, an example that I think we on this call all know is not to make a quick judgment. But again, it just took a few seconds and went, yeah, okay. Um, and it was because there, something about their acknowledgement just sprung up in, in, a, in a flag. Again, you go through it and go, yeah, okay. So um, I just want to... Now, Glide had his hand up, but did I guess you put it down. If not, put it back up, if you will. And then the next person is Christian. It is, yeah. I'm just going to launch the whiteboard whilst Christian asks his questions. I'm sure most of you are familiar with how it works. It's very self-explanatory, um, but I can explain more in the chat. Go ahead, Christian. I can't hear you if you're... I think you may be on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, thanks That's for okay. the presentation. It's uh, my first time uh, listening to someone in the field of research integrity. And um, just disclosure, I'm, I'm sort of new to this. It's kind of been a self-directed push in this direction, still very early Welcome. on in the academic career. So, I mean, on the topic of knowing that people from different countries collaborate, I mean, that's really uh, what I see, you know, sleuths from Netherlands, from the United States, from the UK, right? Um, I think that's happening here. And for me, it's been hard to kind of get my teeth in because as you said, it seems like it's a little bit disconnected. And I was wondering, I, I know you said you were asked by some people, um, how would somebody uh, get involved or learn more, or maybe learn some of these tools or start working with people who are interested in this? And I was just wondering if, if you do have some more maybe actionable um, information you could share? Great question, thanks. So the week after next is Force 11. Before Force 11 is with a very similar sounding thing, it's FISCI, F-S-C-I. And I, along with my colleague, um, Dr. Suze Kundu, are giving our first forensic scientometrics training. We are going to try to record it it will be a first, but it's a place to start. Uh, once we record it, as long as you reach out to me at Leslie at Digital Science, don't email me at Rapeda, although I think it gets forwarded, um, email me and I think we can share that and talk about it. Again, it's a first, it's from some perspectives, but I think it might get you started there. And the other thing is definitely, um, there are more names that are known in this area and some names that are not. So I, th I think we are starting to the point where there are people, it's going to be hard to tell the snake oil salesman from those that have, a, a we have an invisible boundary of ethics around us in working right now or non-codified. And so um, keep an open mind of who you're looking at and why and trust your gut. So that would be my quick thing. And then I hope to get you the training pretty soon. I hope to get it done before I give it in a couple of weeks. That would be good too. Oh, good old professor in me. Uh, Lonnie, thank you. thank you, Christian. Yes, I'll try not to take too much time. Johnny, feel free to tell me to shut up if I need to, right? Uh, you know you know the drill, I think. I talk way too much. Um, Yes, uh, some of the things that you mentioned, I think also brought something that I think is a little bit interesting to me, um, or have, has been of more interest to me recently, as you know, we, we have all these things of transparency being pushed forward. It's a good thing, it's a great thing. Uh, but in some cases, this is not enough, right? Like as Kyle was, for instance, saying, um, like, it would be nice to have, you know, how this collaboration came to happen, you know, that would be great to be able to, to have that kind of data. It would help like people doing these kind of like forensics, uh, check on, on papers, figure out if the paper is fraudulent or not, or likely fraudulent at least. Um, and that comes a little bit into 
uh, something that I've been thinking about recently is uh, what some of my colleagues and I have called um, traceability of science and practices, mm. which is mm -hmm. beyond transparency, right? Transparency, one may argue, is me dumping my data on a repository and being transparent. But if I explain exactly how it was gathered, how it was cleaned, when, why, then I'm adding an extra step of transparency. I'm being transparent about my transparency, right? And that comes actually into traceability of what it is that I have done. And it is currently very hard to for people to provide that because, of course, it's there's no standards is one thing. The other thing is that it takes a lot of time. Uh, and the third thing is it's not necessarily adapted to all uh, scientific outputs, right? Like it works really well, for instance, for let's say quantitative data analysis or the exit kind of thing that we mentioned in the chat for, for photos that are taken. But how do you make that work for a design research? How do you make that work for stuff that is a lot more qualitative? It's very complicated. And this is some of the discussion that we had as well with uh, Brian Nosek from the OSF, um, you know, where mm -hmm. he said, well, you know, the goal of the OSF is to increase transparency and we want the platform eventually to also help with traceability, right? Like that people can look on like past versions of, of let's say, pro registrations and how they have evolved and all of that that you can find, for instance, on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so I think it's a big, big research problem. And that part of my field is trying to tackle in some ways, at least because I work on human computer interaction and data visualization. And so therefore there is a big interest there. The problem is that, you know, as, as you said, finding fundings in some cases is tricky. Uh, but this is exactly the kind of stuff that I think some folks would be happy to participate in. <laughs> Thank you for that. This this makes me think of two things. If I can remember both of them, I'd be doing well for this time of the day. Um, first thing is, it's one of the reasons that we decided to go forward with just naming a field. And because if you don't have a field, you don't get funding. So I, I will be speaking to people at the NIH soon. I will be, I can say that publicly. I will be speaking with other funders, but it makes a huge difference. So if you think the title is goofy, Forensic Scientometrics, which it may be, and at least we shorten it to FOSI, um, it's, it's because we need a field. And by the, I mean, everybody I think knows that forensic science is already taken. So hence the Forensic Scientometrics. And then, the second point is, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical for just a second. And that is that um, without trying to be religious, but, but bear with me on this, is are we looking for physical problems to a more spiritual, it, it's physical solutions to a more spiritual problem here? Um, and just bear with me on that in that. Um, we have a huge issue coming out in where things are in this world, um, politically, geopolitically, and we cannot divorce ourselves from what's going on in the world around us. So while we want to improve science, while we want to improve research for those of us who are in here, we also have the job of both defending what we are doing, no matter how messy it is, supporting it and making it better all at once. And I think it is upon us to always remember that as we move forward and we're looking for those physical solutions of continuing to make, you know, things a little bit better and more traceable. And I couldn't agree more, Lonnie, on, you know, making things more transparent. At the same time, we need to know where we stand with what we do or do not believe in and what we're doing. And so I'm just going to put that out there and leave it. Thank you so much. And I don't know. Thank you. Is it Lamis or Lamy? Or... It's Lamis. Thank you. Lamis. Thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. And I enjoyed the discussion. I'm just, uh, I can't help it, but being kind of a bit worried, you know, feeling that the current system that you, you guys have developed is a bit leaning towards being unfair to those uh, from the global south. For example, talking from my community, I'm from Sudan, I could like mm -hmm. confidently say that maybe only 5% of academic institutions have an academic email, uh, official email. So most of us work without an official email. A lot of us don't have an ORCID ID. 
uh, we might be funded by organizations that that are not known, that are not out there, but they are known for our community. Uh, our institutions, for example, it could be a small institution that's not that doesn't have a digital presence, for example. Uh, also, you've public you you've mentioned that, for example, there's a trend of publications going up and then down, like not be them not being consistent. And this is something that I always see in, in my community. Um, and also the 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 network collaboration, the the like the pattern of it. So I don't know why, but but I have this feeling that uh, I don't know, this will put us in trouble more. You know, we already are facing that prejudice of, you know, for example, science coming from Africa is already, you know, not good. So this makes me really worried, you know, I, I don't know why. Maybe it's it's not a, a, a feeling that I should be feeling because I don't understand the topic well, but I just wanted to put it out there. I really appreciate you putting this out there. And I actually have some good news on that because the countries with the absolute best trust markers come from Africa. Ethiopia has been tops when it's data availability statement with ethics statement. And I'm going from memory. I think Uganda is now one. Um, the Gambia is also up there, but out. And, and these are also, we're looking at countries with a, a certain output of publications. We've also found in our research that those collaborations that have an Ethiopian as a first author actually have better trust markers than those if they have a non, if they have a global north author on it. Um, so there are some great influences that are coming out of Africa and different countries vary just like everywhere else. We are trying to get that narrative out. And in fact, on Friday, I'm talking with the African journal AJPP. It's a, a group that's working with journals, looked at their journals. And yeah, you know, OK, some of the websites look like they're from, you know, 2000 and you get but you dig into the, the research and everything and it looks good. And if people can't see past that, that's a problem. But I think we need to get that narrative out a bit more to your point. And I think that what you were saying, I mean, it are, is obviously valid um, because when anyone is in a more disadvantaged space, you have to fight harder and you have to fight against that, that common narrative, which isn't necessarily a correct narrative. So we'll try to work harder. I'm working with a woman named Joy Awongo, actually quite a few of us. She lives in Kenya. And so over, um, I know, I'd say not too far, but it's it's probably far from where you are. And um, as in, I, I know countries aren't quite as close, but let's keep getting that narrative out for the good work that is going on where it's going on. By the way, I mean, and it far surpasses a place like Harvard, who also has a lot of people without orchids. So let's just be real about where things are and as, as a community of scientists, so. I don't know how you've done it, but you've managed to hit perfect time again. <laughs> um, I think a really good discussion is always the sign of a really good and interesting talk. So I think oh, thank you. very much on behalf of everyone, thank you for, for all of that. It's something I'm incredibly interested in. I didn't get asked my questions. I will email you my questions. Oh, um, okay. But thank you so much. This will be up on YouTube uh, relatively soon. I'll try and do it this evening. Um, but yeah, I, I guess we would love to have you back at some point is the biggest takeaway I'm taking from this. I would love to come back. Thank you so much for having me and uh, keep up all the good work.